Next up, we have Langdon talking about app streams. All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I thought because it was a CentOS Dojo, I wanted to make 100% sure that I got a Fedora template in here just for <laughs> entertainment value, uh, my entertainment value. Um, sorry, I'm very thirsty, so I will be pausing a lot during this. Um, so to uh, Neil's comment, at the end there is actually a link to the guy who actually wrote this uh, um, uh, template, because it wasn't me. Uh, first, I'd like to do a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm Langdon White. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I joined Red Hat as a developer advocate for RHEL, with my claim to fame being I've done production applications in every major language, with the exception of Python. Uh, so now I exclusively write code in Python, just to make myself have more pain. Um, I moved into becoming a platform architect role, which kind of meant within RHEL, uh, trying to coordinate all the various uh, teams. Um, uh, you know, so basically each of the engineering groups would have an architect, and then we kind of worked together to make sure that we weren't overlapping and stuff. Obviously, RHEL is a very big piece of software, so uh, we needed some coordination across it. Uh, during the course of that work, I actually became the Fedora Modularity Objective Lead, uh, which basically meant spearheading this kind of modularity concept, uh, which came out of, if you uh, roll way back, the Fedora Rings concept, um, and led to modularity. I like to show off my kids and how proud I was to get them all into a nice single picture, uh, because it's really easy to get all your children in one place at one time. Um, and uh, as you can see, that's clearly the same photo. Um, all right, so just, uh, can I actually ask, I'll start here and just ask, uh, how many people have ever seen a modularity talk before? Okay, how many people have any history or knowledge of modularity or app streams? Okay, um, Terry I know is lying, so uh, he's clearly not paying attention. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background on, on the point um, and which will hopefully lead to the what we're doing here. Um, so, one of the things that we notice in software is that, particularly in the Linux distributions, is that we ship the same thing the same way all the time. And that sounds like a good thing, except when it's not. So basically, we have different use cases that we put our software to. And that's a little bit of the problem, in that we have, you know, a house, and then we have a house. Right? These are two different things, same kind of concept, but if you built this house in that place, bad things will happen, right? And vice versa. Um, and so when we distribute, for example, you know, a web server, we want to distribute it in such a way that it can be run in production, but sometimes we also want to distribute it in a way that it's run as a developer mode, right? So somebody can use it as a developer. Why do developers instantly turn off SE Linux and firewalls and all that stuff? Because they can't figure out how to make the production installed application into be one that is used by a developer without just deleting everything because they're not sysadmins. So we want to not have to force them in that position. And we do have actually certain RPMs uh, that solve for some of these problems. The problem is they're not discoverable. So they may even be exist and be maintained and all that stuff, but did you know, for example, that there's an RPM you can install uh, that will convert HTTPD into running out of your home public HTML directory? You do not have to use one of the 1,000 guides on the internet on how to do this. There's literally an RPM that you can install. <laughs> First, did you know that existed? Let's see, raise hands. Okay, second, can you? are you surprised that I can't ever remember the name of it? <laughs> right? So. <laughs> Point being, it's not discoverable. All right, another thing that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years is the pendulum has swung away, well, okay, so let's back up even further. Late 90s, um, developers basically owned what gets released because developers and sysadmins was basically synonymous in many, many cases. Then over that few years into, like say the 2000s, as distributions, like Linux distributions really took off, the pendulum on who was in power about what was actually deployed in production swung towards the sysadmins. Um, and so increasingly, we actually had safe systems that were updated on a consistent and regular basis, and developers were unhappy across the board. Um, around 2000, uh, sorry, 2010, 2015, uh, the pendulum started swinging back the other way. 
And so you started to see books like, um, actually we'll talk about that in a second, but the pendulum started to swing back the other way and back towards developers, okay? Because the, the developers were feeling constrained too much by the sysadmin and the barrier to entry to doing a de deployment kept dropping, right? You had things like Heroku, you know, even OpenShift.com, um, you know, AWS, et cetera, meant that I could go as a developer and just launch whatever I wanted. Then I could show it to the CEO and I could show it to them and say, hey, this is making a million dollars a day. And then I say, but the sysadmins won't let me deploy it. Guess who's gonna win that argument, right? The million dollars a day argument. So the pendulum swung back. Um, and so the other thing that has changed pretty significantly is how we do development, right? So we have, um, you know, like Phoenix Project, which, you know, did a lot for DevOps. Um, we have, you know, kind of our, you know, we have all these different programming languages that start way further up the stack. We have huge amounts of open source software we can build things on. So now building an architecture and deploying it is a matter of a week, right? Versus the big waterfall <coughs> systems we would do in the past, which would take a year to get to a deployment. So all of these things have changed about how we do software development, but very little about how we deploy it and release it and manage it has changed very much. Then the other thing that we talked about a little bit, which is the, you know, another argument in the same case here, is that our operating system users, this is the Venn diagram of their user needs. What, how is this different from many Venn diagrams? There's no bloody overlap, right? <laughs> Yes, occasionally <laughs> you get like two people who agree on something, you know, but they're like secretly in a room and nobody tells anybody. Um, <laughs> so all of these different things kind of led to, I mean, over the years, it's led to a bunch of different types of solutions to these problems, right? So you see everything from, um, you know, uh, like PyPI, which is a deployment mechanism. You see things like, um, RVM, which is a Ruby virtual environments mechanism, you see, and you have one of those actually in basically every major language. You have individual package management for every major language. You have um, things like the alternatives infrastructure, which allows you to have different applications take priority in different systems. Then you have things like software collections, which are trying to take priority by application. Um, so you have lots and lots of different solutions. And the argument that we in Fedora were starting to make is that it doesn't go enough to the core of the problem. Uh, and so what we did was we said, let's step up, back a little bit and really try to go after the core of the problem, which is that you, he, you have different use cases under different conditions. Um, and one of the things that we talk about this a lot as is the too fast, too slow problem. So if I pull you know, this person over here in the room and say, you know, does CentOS release uh, the Apache web server often enough, they will say no. But if I ask somebody over here, they will say yes, right? Um, and then the other one will complain about something else being too slow and vice versa, right? So basically, if you go and pull any given point for any given use case, you're gonna get people saying that some aspects of it are too fast and some aspects are too slow, and they will rarely agree. So that's what we're going after. All right, so, that was the modularity project in Fedora. Um, went on for many, many years. It's still going on today. Um, and it has recently come to RHEL um, as application streams. So the concept in Fedora land is the modularity concept. Um, and then kind of its implementation in RHEL. Everybody knows what I mean by RHEL, right? Red Hat Enterprise Linux, just to make sure. Um, as an application stream. So an application stream is, now, you know, I'm, I'm giving a talk, right? So that's why I'm giving you all this background on the why and the what fors and all that stuff. But really what you need to know as a, as a consumer of it is just these application streams. And this idea here is just that there's a new way of delivering these sets of software that we deliver normally such that they can conflict with each other without conflicting. So that we can have multiple and the reason we use the term stream, because we don't want to say versions. So in other words, we can have Postgres 9 and Postgres 10, but we could also have Postgres unstable, right? And Postgres 10 and Postgres 9. So they're not always strictly versions, but the idea is that they're streams. So there's, there are certain expectations you have around the content set that will land in that stream. 
So when I go and install or use or consume or whatever Postgres 10, I, I have an expectation that everything in there will be related to Postgres version 10. But if I go and install and consume Postgres on stable, I have an expectation that everything will be about their, basically their dev release, right? So I'm trying to do some new cutting edge with GIS stuff. Maybe I go after their unstable version to make sure I'm ahead of the curve enough that when it actually lands in production, my application is not behind, right? So I want to use something that's unstable while I'm doing development. So that's why we call them streams and not versions. So a little bit more about streams. Okay, well you can have alternative streams. So basically what this means is for any given, and we like to start to use the term user space now, because we can't say VM, right? Because that could mean different containers inside of VM. We can't be, say like physical server. Um, we, you know, so basically we have all these different ways now of striating you know, computing resources. So if you think about them each as an individual user space, that's what the collision uh, definition is here. So, so for any given user space, we can have different streams installed, or you know, or enabled or installed. Um, discoverability. We wanted to make sure that you can now list a set of what is available because at the end of the day, right? Do you care per se about that? You know, rel blah 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 version is releasing. You know, Postgres nine versus ten versus eleven versus twelve. You don't really care about that. What you care about is, I need Postgres, okay? So I need Postgres, so therefore, that's what I'm gonna go search for. Then secondarily, it's gonna tell me it's, you have nine and 10 and 11 available. And so because you wanna migrate from RHEL 7, which has, I don't know, what's this, I don't actually know, but Postgres 9 on it, um, you know that you wanna select Postgres 9 because you don't wanna upgrade the application along with your operating system. But then at some future point, you want to be able to search for and say, what, averse, what other streams do you have of Postgres available? Um, all right, content dependencies. The other thing is that when you choose a stream, it's going to cause other streams to become enabled and therefore disable or make things disallowed uh, that are not in that same dependency path. So, you know, obviously when you make choices about Postgres 10, that's going to have impact on the rest of your system about what else you can have. Um, and then lifecycle support. Every stream can also have a different lifecycle. So, for example, Postgres 9 is probably going to have a, a, you know, an end of life much sooner than Postgres 10. Right? But we can make it very clear around the individual stream itself what that support lifecycle looks like. Um, and then similar subscriptions. Um, so, the other thing that this allows is to have a single repository for all of this content. We'll talk about that more a little in a minute. Um, questions so far? Am I going too fast? Too slow? Let's see what I did there. All right. So, this is the RHEL 7 repository of infrastructure. Um, you know, just memorize that. You should, you should know that at all times. Um, I think this is why there's such slow adoption of new versions of RHEL because it takes so long to memorize all the different repositories you, could, you need to use to actually install it. Um, so one of the things we were trying to do with RHEL, right, was make it simpler to install and set up. So uh, we kind of crashed all of this stuff into just these. And so now, the content set that is the stuff to get your operating system up and running in any scenario is just this base OS guy over here, okay? You don't have to worry about compute node versus workstation versus client or whatever, that content set's all the same. And then, all the extra stuff you need, so the applications that you wanna use on top of your operating system are all in AppStream. Now, that can be a little bit of a misnomer because AppStream includes content that is um, non-modular RPMs as well as modular RPMs. So in other words, just regular old RPMs because we only want to ship one version of it. Um, um, I think I took that slide out from this talk. But, um, so I can't, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I think Bind, for example, is a non-modular RPM. There's just one version. It's sitting there in AppStream but you, there's not multiple streams of it. Um, whereas there are definitely two different streams for Postgres, for example. 
Um, so I just want to point out that little bit of misnomer. Um, the other thing I want to point out too is this Code Ready Linux Builder, um, which you know this is being recorded, so I won't say too much about um, because that would be colorful. But <laughs> the idea there is that that's all the stuff that you need as a um, you know consumer of RHEL or developer for RHEL um, that isn't going to land in production. Okay, so it's all the um, develop libraries or whatever that you want to build against. Um, I wrote a blog post about this, so you can go read if you like, which I think does a pretty good job of explaining when you need that and when you don't. So the reason I want to point all this out for the CentOS Dojo is because of this slide, which is, we haven't shipped it yet, so we don't actually know what this is going to look like, and it's going to be different to some extent, even if you look at RHEL 7 versus CentOS 7, uh, the repository structures are different, right? So basically there's a lot more um, sorry, I just want to see what my next slide is. All right. Um, there's a lot more uh, kind of content directly in the equivalent of this repository in the CentOS 7 scenario. There's no supplementary at all, right, because the, uh, CentOS doesn't ship any license encumbered content, which is what supplementary is. Um, and then optional, I think, is crashed into here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where optional lives. Uh, the point being is that this kind of structure is quite different with CentOS, um, and you know, so kind of roughly all the content is there, but it's not. It, it just kind of the way it's structured is different. Then you also have the massive complexity of Apple, which I think was launched today. Mm -hmm. Was it? Yeah. Was that uh, uh, beta or was that final? It's beta until we have um, CentOS HEA. Right. Okay. Right. But for all intents and purposes, final. Okay, so, you know, so Apple is a huge um, kind of wrinkle to drawing this picture. So, um, until we actually can ship the CentOS 8GA uh, and, an, and Apple that goes with it, I can't make, you know, useful remarks here, except to say that my hope is that Cent will follow the same argument that RHEL did, which is, let's make this less painful. Um, and do something like this base OS model um, and an app stream model. And it would be nice, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to pull this off, but it would be really nice if app stream kind of merges with the Apple concept so that, so that you don't really even have to know that they're kind of two separate things. But we'll see how that shakes out. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't, I don't think it'll matter, kind of. I just, it's more like the simplicity of, of how this stuff works. Uh, yes, Mr. Wade. Um, does everybody in the room know what an Apple is or what you said there? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, all right, so if you're unaware of what Apple is, uh, Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux um, is actually a set of content produced by the Fedora infrastructure or the Fedora packaging community um, that targets enterprise Linux use cases. So, excuse me, if you have something that is, um, you know, from recent history, um, you might use that in Fedora, and then so you might want to build that for Enterprise Linux. Um, and I probably shouldn't trash RHEL all the time, but it's fun. Um, but you uh, basically, so it gets rebuilt uh, for that environment. Uh, and so it's a totally community-led uh, and driven project that makes primarily Fedora content available on the various Enterprise Linux uh, environments. And it's usually nicknamed Apple. Um, and if you go to what is, is it just? Wiki slash Apple. Yep. But it's a CentOS wiki, right? No, it's the Fedora wiki. Fedora wiki, okay. Wiki so, FPO slash uh, Apple, and that's the page. Right, okay. I was like blanking for a minute. Um, so, yeah, so if you go to the uh, Fedora project wiki page for the Apple, um, it will have download and install instructions there if you need it. And it is very, very useful if you haven't used it before. All right, so now I'm going to try to do a demo. And um, this is what I was planning on doing before get, getting called up early, so this may or may not go terribly. <laughs> I mean, it's a demo, so it's going to go terribly. Just no question. It could go well. It could. All right. Legible? Can you guys read it back there? I, I, I can make it bigger. Oh, we can get. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's good. All right. 
I don't need to do that. It's gonna fail anyway. All right, so uh, just by way of a little context, I don't want to restart it because we'll lose our cache. This is um, all right. Has anybody heard of UBI? Raise your hands if you've heard of UBI. Okay, so um, around the time that we shipped, sorry, I work for Red Hat. If I didn't mention that already, thought it was probably <laughs> obvious, but just in case. Um, so around the time we shipped uh, Rel 8, we also shipped um, some new kind of base level containers. Uh, one of them is called uh, Universal Base Image, um, because apparently we're taking naming conventions now from Microsoft. Um, so the Universal Base Image is a set of RHEL, literal RHEL content, that we make available for free in an unencumbered way to base uh, containers on. So if you want to do uh, you know, an Apache Web Server container, uh, you can base it on UBI and build it that way and you know, add your secret sauce, whatever that is, um, and then distribute it uh, that way. Obviously, there's T's and C's in there that I don't know off the top of my head, but the, the bulk of it is you don't need a subscription to use it. So you can essentially, um, and where's Dan? I don't, he's big. Um, so you can podman pull um, the, uh, uh, from, the, from the Red Hat repository, um, and it's just called, does anybody else know it off the top of their heads? I think it's rel8 slash UBI. No, no, um, UBI slash UBI8. There you go. Um, yeah, I can never remember. I have to look it up like every time. So, point being is there's a UBI, there's also a UBI minimal, and then there's a UBI something else. Uh, it's super handy. There's one for RHEL 7, one for RHEL 8. So this is the RHEL 8 one, so that I don't have to be running RHEL 8 in order to make the demo, right? Okay, that was a long talk. Um, so I forgot we switched it all back to Young. Um, so, let me just, sorry. So let's start easy. Whoa, Ooh. That was not yeah, good. that's 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 too big. Let's see if we can make this. Yeah, all right. So you don't really need to be able to read this part because I just want to show up kind of the columns and stuff. So basically you have here is the module or application, if you think of the term application stream. So that's what this first column is. So we have Nginx. Um, my brother said the name of that the other day to me, and with something which made it clear he had never heard it out loud before, but now I can't remember what it was because I want to use it all the time. Um, but Node.js, Perl, Python, um, blah, 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 you know, some software that you might like. Um, then you have the streams, okay? So this is the application streams, um, and where are some multiple, where's Postgres? Oh, come on. Seriously, is it not in the UBI? Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> oh, well, not. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's so did you mention that UBI does not include all raw content? I did say that. Okay. Um, I didn't. I thought Postgres was in there. Otherwise, uh, I would have chosen something else for my demo. Um, so it's more, I think, the developer-oriented Yeah, it's, tools it's more like, like, it's like programming languages, primarily, and like that tool chain, and then web development kind of stuff. It's not like the big iron stuff, like databases. Um, doesn't really matter for the this purposes of the story, but, um, and don't forget, you can always add Postgres to it. It just wouldn't be the one that rel ships. Um, so you have the stream here, and what you would normally see if you have multiple streams would be, they'd be listed, you know, again, with the other stream name here. This little D means default, and I'll show you a little bit about what that means in a minute. Um, and then you have profiles, which is kind of the common use case you might want to put that stream to. So, for example, Node.js is going to be in a common scenario, or a development scenario, or a minimal scenario, or even a minimal, um, or S2I. And then, obviously, some sort of description of there. And then you can also get a bunch more info um, on them. So yeah, so I just wiped my laptop recently. That's why I didn't have 50,000 containers already here. Um, but, so this tells you a little bit more uh, about it. You know, it's just like 
um, you know, Yum info on an RPM package. Uh, but this is on a module. Okay, so uh, module. That is not a module info. That's a package info. Oh, did I type the wrong thing? Yep. You need to do Yum module info. Yeah, sorry. Typo. There we go. So um, this tells you a little bit about the module. Obviously, the RPM still work. Um, but, you know, there's some interesting things here, right? So it tells you, you know, there is a version within the stream, which you don't have to worry about. That's what's kind of nice about it. Um, but the artifacts here, so these are all the different RPMs that make up the module, um, including what they built as, et cetera. Um, but what I wanted to show you a little bit about with defaults is if I say yum install node.js, that's going to just work, okay? And the fact that it had the little D in square brackets around the stream meant that that just works. And how does that just work? It says, excuse me, this module stream, any RPM that is available if this stream was enabled, treat it as if it's enabled by default unless somebody explicitly does something else. Um, so that would install Node.js. And the, but what's nice about this is that, let's see if I can tell, um, is that it's also a, like a bit more sophisticated meta package. So basically what those <coughs> profiles do is let you say, oh, when somebody asks for Node.js, and I take the default profile, so in this case, common, actually install this set of RPMs. Which, if you think about meta packages, that's essentially what they do today. Um, young groups are similar, except they're weirder. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have, you know, so the meta package for Node.js, this, this example isn't great, because the meta package actually does install NPM anyway, um, but, this lets us be more explicit about it, and it lets us change it depending on use case. So I might say, let's see if it actually works, because that would be awesome. But so if I say, so I was hoping that minimal would drop NPM. But it, like, if you've done anything in Node.js, npm is really part of minimal. Um, so I'm not entirely surprised. But the idea would be is that you know, in uh, you know, in Python, for example, if you were installing Python, you might not get pip, right? If you were doing a minimal. Um, so that way, because in the meta package scenario, you have to have it every time, right? You can't have different conditions. You can do it to some extent, right? You can say um, you can tell Yum to not install docs for example, but you can't say, under this condition, install this uh, set of RPMs, and under that condition, install a different one. Uh, that's what the profiles let you do. All right. So, not as well as I had hoped, but not terrible. Let me go back to my slide. So, oh, we did have this slide here, sorry. Um, I, I think this is a little out of order. So basically, things that belong in base OS seem obvious. Things that, these are the things that make your operating system go. Um, we, I think, and, and we, I mean the Linux community in a lot of ways, would like this box to get as small as possible, right? We want this box to have as much independence from this box as we can possibly have. And the reason is, is because every time we do a hardware refresh, we want to update this box, and we never want to update that box at the same time, right? We almost always want to do them independently, but we want to be able to do this update as soon as we possibly can when we do a hardware refresh, and then as basically we have QE resources available, it, it is, I swear to God, it's always QE at almost every company I've ever worked with, you want to up, do things like upgrades from Postgres 9 to Postgres 10. Those are rarely blocked on development or sysadmins. It's blocked on testing. So in application stream, though, as I was kind of saying before, that I thought I didn't have an example of, we have applications that 
are in single stream, so there's a single version of, but they're not even treated as modular. They don't really make sense to have multiple versions of. And then we have kind of things that are bigger, more traditional applications that might have multiple versions. Uh, some in the RHEL case, we're shipping two streams, but we have actually very few multiple streams because in the default stream use case, for the most part, we want to uh, support them for the full life cycle of RHEL, right? So as per normal, we want to ship a, a relatively small subset and then let it grow as customers demand, right? Um, in the CentOS world, I think this is going to get crazy really fast because basically you can have all of Fedora available as streams on your CentOS platform, right? So that's the idea. Um, so I showed that demo already. Um, and let me give you a little bit more about the use cases. So basically, we talked about kind of the default, and we have no app streams are enabled at all. Um, but if you do, so you have, that's the default install of Relate, but if you yum install something from one of the default module streams, it will just show up, which will also cause an app stream to be enabled. So a user is selected to enable an app stream either explicitly or implicitly by installing something out of app stream, okay? So we are working on some changes to make it so that explicit is only when you do it explicitly, but right now, um, if you get something because it came out of defaults, it's treated as if it was explicit, which is probably the wrong user experience at this point. But it's in progress. Um, a hotfix repo. So one of the other things is, you know, not that anyone has ever seen any bugs in Linux before, um, you might occasionally have, you know, want to patch your background, and so that's why you want a hotfix. So RHEL, of course, would supply you with a new, prettier background um, via what's called a hotfix repo. This is, in the world of the app streams or whatever, incredibly complex, so that's why it's explicitly mentioned. So when you're dealing with a hotfix repo, it's worth understanding what's really going on there. Um, to make sure that it's going to upgrade in the ways that you expect it to. Um, how many are out of time? Anyway? Almost well, four. You, okay. you started off schedule a little early, so you got as much time as you need. But uh, yeah, like ten or fifteen minutes before you guys are bored with me. At least thirty. <laughs> I must be getting better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then, so you can also have a hotfix repo and an app stream enabled. Again, the complexity of these two scenarios it is quite high. So, or the, the actual scenario at any given time is not high. The problem is what happens when you say yum upgrade, right? Or yum install some new thing. So making sure you understand how that layering works um, is important. And, you know, briefly, um, a, an RPM is always superseded by a modular RPM unless it's explicitly blocked by a hotfix repo, okay? Which is very easy to state, and uh, you know, like I can try and explain it better, but there's not a lot of better ways to explain it. You just kind of have to think about it and let it kind of percolate in your brain for a while um, and probably have a couple of things break before you uh, really get it. Um, but the point <laughs> is that most of, oh, actually, and these are where my next slides go. Um, but I want to point out these few things, which is packages with the highest version prevail that yum can see, right? So if, it, if the stream is disabled, yum doesn't see it. It's not part of the transaction options. So if I have Postgres and, uh, the Postgres 9 stream installed or enabled in, or installed, um, any Postgres 10 RPMs that happen to be in the repo are not visible to yum, okay? Non-modular packages are filtered out with a match with modular packages, which I just said. And then, like I said, hotfix is actually supersede modules. So, I do have pictures. I forgot. I thought I cut these slides. Um, so, first off, uh, you have the no app strings available uh, or enabled. So, um, we have you know this bash version that's coming from base OS. Um, 
Bash 5 is in the AppStream repo. The AppStream repo is enabled, right? So the yum repo is turned on. But the bash module AppStream is not. Okay? And it's not declared in the default. So as a result, it's not visible to yum. Does that make sense? Not. Wave. Yeah? All right. All right. Next scenario. We have an app stream enabled. Okay, so now we still have that bash four coming from base OS, okay? But now we have said yum, you know, module enable bash colon five or something that caused the bash five stream to be enabled. Now bash 5.0 there is visible to yum, and if I say yum upgrade, it will choose that one, okay? Yeah, we spent a bunch of time on these. I should have realized they were good. Um, all right. So now we have the next scenario, which is that we have the base OS 4, uh, or sorry, base OS bash 4, and then we found a bug in that. So um, we called support, and they said, here's a hot fix for that bash before it ships. Um, and so you want to turn it on here, but the bash 5 is technically in the app stream. App stream is, is, the yum repo is turned on, but the module string is off, so it's not there. Okay, I'm confused with this. Uh, oh, okay. Why is, what does the hotfix repo have to matter about any of this? I'm, what is, you're updating a thing that's in base OS. Why is it in, why does it need a module hotfixes thing for that? Um, it doesn't. Um, it does okay. if at some point in the future you enabled something in AppStream. Okay. So it, it's the future case that you're protecting against. Like this? Correct. Um, so now both of them are available, except that the hotfix is superseding the base OS version. but it still wouldn't be selected because you have the bash 5 stream, right? Correct, right. So now instead of taking bash 4.4-2, four four you're gonna go take bash 5. Okay. And, and we're basically missing a slide, I realize, which is that... Yeah, I wanna see that scenario of the hotfix for bash 5. Right. Um, yeah, so we're basically, yeah, we're kind of missing a slide where um, the, I'm just trying to think of a good way to explain it. Um, so if we had a bash four in this app stream here, um, so let's say there's a base OS that comes out with bash four, then there's a stream that comes out with bash 4, which has, you know, whatever, 4.5. Um, but then you want a hotfix on 4.5. You can actually have this override this guy, which is not, which this guy can't do. You have to have that module hotfix on the repo. Does that make sense? This is only the second time I've given this talk, so it's a little, it's a little rough on some of the things that you should want to talk about. Um, I'm, all right. So I'm I'm a little confused. What the what is the impact of the hotfix repo with AppStream stuff? What is what's supposed to be special about it? So a hotfix repo. Uh, so so that's a literal yum repo. So if it's if it's flagged as a hotfix repo, it means that even if it's an RPM that should be superseded by a module, it still wins. Otherwise, you'd never pick up the hotfix because the module content would supersede it. Right. Oh, uh, okay. So it was one of those things, how can we give you a hotfix that works with modularity? Um, because the current logic, you'd never be able to see it. Right. Or right. if the so module hotfix is the one thing in the... Yeah, I mean, yeah, just been setting that and just making it treat all repos with normal NVR comparisons. Oh. 
Um, right. So the thing is, so the thing is, you don't want it to treat it as normal NVR comparisons when you have stream enabled because you like. That's why this probably why this slide is missing is because the example it's not great. So basically, it's when you want to think about it as a dependency. So you know, libfoo v1 is here. I'm oh, sorry, libfoo v2 is here. Libfoo v1 is here because this guy needs libfoo v1. V2 is going to override it, right? Even though I need it for that particular stream. Mm -hmm. So as a result, if you have libfoo and a module is enabled that includes a libfoo, it will override even if it loses on the NVR. Mm -hmm. Unless you're explicitly marking a repo as a hotfix repo. Then libfoo v3 will supersede the v1 that was in that module. So it makes it so that normal NVR comparisons happen regardless of module status. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. But only for that hotfix repo. Right. So a hotfix, oh, regardless of app streams, masks the original bash. Okay. Yes. Any kind. Right. So that would happen like like you throw out modularity, and that would have that's how normal NVR overlays would work. Right. App streams don't matter. We we could have it or not. It's it's gone. Um, well, so it will only do it for the things that are in there. So, so you know, if we had lib, lib bar and this was downgrading it, right? But lib bar wasn't in here because there wasn't a hotfix for it. It would still take the downgrade over what was in the base bus. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think I think there's definitely a missing slide for that bit. Yeah, that case is. All right, so I just want to kind of say a little bit, you know, about like where we are now, which is, um, you know, we have a laundry list of things we would like to improve about how DNF and YUM work. Um, however, the more we get this in front of people, the more we get feedback on how it works and the more you can tell us. Um, obviously, for this room, we need CentOS 8 to be out, um, but our expectation is, you know, everything about modularity that is in RHEL is, in, is essentially the same as upstream at this point. So I expect that almost exactly what's in Fedora and RHEL and CentOS to basically be in pretty close lockstep around how modularity uh, delivers, right, or how it's implemented. Um, so any changes we make, obviously we'll play around with them and throw our bit, but I expect that they'll pass through to both RHEL and Senate very quickly. Um, so the more feedback, the better. Um, and Terry is here directly to take your feedback. <laughs> yes. Um, so I had a couple slides I didn't finish, obviously, because I ran out of time. That was what I was supposed to be doing in the half hour before I got up here. Um, I'm running this small conference that's coming up. It's called DevConf. It starts tomorrow. Uh, it's been taking up a bit of my time. I got to spend an extra night in Amsterdam on Monday night that I was not planning on. Uh, so that was fun. So more questions. Are there any more demos I can show you of, um, of like the UBI or like, of modularity in action? Um, anything you didn't understand that I can show more pictures of? I have a question. Yeah. How does one build? How does one build a module in house? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the question. Oh, okay, so you got it on the thing. Um, see, me repeating the question gives me a chance to think about the answer. Um, <laughs> and he can take that away from. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so at Summit, at Summit this year, I actually demoed that uh, with a lab. So it is possible. It is difficult, um, especially on RHEL itself. Uh, you, it's a little easier to do it on Fedora. This is on the heavy duty punch list for the modularity team to improve as we go forward. Um, there are certain scenarios, like Neil's, for example, that are uh, that are not possible at all at this point. Um, 
because he has a kind of an unusual build system, and so he actually wants to kind of manufacture a module out of the result of a build done in another way. But if you build using our full pipeline, you can do it. You can do it offline. You can do it yourself. You what you want to do is go find the MBS. Um, uh, it's called like FFM MBS local is what it's actually <coughs> called. Right. So well, the package in the package in Fedora is MBS. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. you want to go find module build service. Uh, specifically, you want to look for uh, local builds with that, um, or take a look at my Summit Lab, um, which has a very long set of uh, markdown that will tell you exactly what to do. Is there a plan to make this working mock? Uh, it's the other way around. Um, so MBS currently, to do a lot of local build, actually orchestrates mock. Um, and it does it all right. It's just, it's not, it, it actually, it, it works fine. It's just not, it doesn't do a bunch of the feature set you want. So for example, you have to use um, like the same architecture that you're currently on. There's no support for, for doing other architectures. Uh, you can't do a change of um, build route. For example, it, you have to use whatever for Fedora is currently building the build route on, stuff like that. So, so like if you if you don't want to be able to set any flags or options, you can do it just fine. The problem is that's unusual, <laughs> right? Like, why are you rebuilding it if you don't want to do options, right? Um, if so, you set up the full, if you set up the code use in MBS, you can access all the features. But that's pretty much right. all other kind of work. I am aware of it. So, just, so the idea is that we wanted to work with mock. Um, and let you have kind of all those other flags. So it's very good for, I want to, I, I have this piece of content that I am getting from Fedora land. I would like to make that available on a modular realm mm -hmm. or some point sent. Then it's great. It'll be, you, it can do what you want right now, as long as it's the same architecture, which is uh, probably the first thing we'll go try to fix. Um, but if you're trying to do what you would think of as like a rebuild, where you'd want, you want to change parts of the build route, you want to change compiler flags, things like that, that's where it's going to fall down pretty hard. Or I have a thing that is not a frame built in house that I would like to package and deliver as a module. So that you should be able to do. Okay. That's um, the simple case. Right, because that's, that's the simple case, because you're not, you're, you're not trying to do anything special to it, you're just saying, here, build this, for this target. Yeah, my specific, the specific use case I have in mind is that we have a interesting packaging of MySQL we use in house uh, that would probably be a good idea to have packaged up as a module so it doesn't fight with right. MariaDB or whatever. So be. that's the easy case. The hard yeah. case is if you want to override content that is already being provided by them in a way that you can uh, you do customizations rather than doing something. Those things are, are a problem. Or if you need to uh, turn on a feature that rel disabled. Like so, the popular example that I hear a lot of is, well, rel eight disabled Samba AD again, and uh, yeah. it's available if you take the module and rebuild it. But doing that is non-trivial, and that more or less requires currently a Koji and an MBS to do it. So like if you want to rebuild portions of Rail, not even the whole thing, but just portions of it, you need the full orchestration in order for it to work properly. Right. So, All right. So long story short, if you have a piece of software that you just want to make available for you know Rail or Send or whatever, that should be very or, or pretty straightforward. Um, obviously there's probably some bugs there that hasn't gotten a whole lot of use. But conceptually, it's there. Um, and that's what I do in my Sunday lab, is I basically make, what was that I was doing? Probably oh, hello world of some kind. <laughs> no, it, it, was, um, it was some framework platform. Oh, a Flask app. Um, and making that available on RHEL, um, even though Flask is not. Um, I'd actually like to see that. I didn't really see that. Um, it was a lab. So, um, so the whole thing's in GitHub, um, and definitely executable. Um, you know, obviously, if you find bugs, let me know. Um, but yeah, so so that that kind of use case does work, but it's on the the laundry list of making that better. Um, and and we're taking patches, so feel free to come by and fix it yourself. Try, mm -hmm. <laughs> fix it correctly. Sorry, unlike what Neil wants. Uh, any any other comments questions? 
All right. Well, hope this was useful. Cool. Thank you, Langdon. Yes, anytime.